Climate change is an existential threat to life on Earth. The World Health Organization predicts that in 30 years, it will be directly responsible for the deaths of over 250,000 people each year. Many feel governments are failing to respond, and it's unlikely that the Paris Agreement target of keeping the global temperature rise below 2 degrees centigrade will be met. But determined pressure groups believe change is possible. They're seeking to push urgent environmental action to the top of the political agenda. And these movements are gathering momentum. I'm Laurel Chor in the US, where a group of young activists is pushing for a radical shift in government policy in order to avert a climate crisis. And I'm Megan McCubbin in the UK, and I've come to learn about a movement known as Extinction Rebellion whose members believe that the only route to environmental change is for a people's uprising. Fearful for the planet they will inherit, young people around the world are standing up and demanding a better future. In the US, a growing and passionate group of youth is campaigning for urgent environmental action, and they're forcing the adults to listen. We're talking about pain that's happening now. Let's show them what courage looks like, am I right? This is the Sunrise Movement. In the space of just two years, this group of activists, most of whom are under 30, has grown to 100,000 members. Our party needs to work for us, not for the 1% and the wealthy. Oh, yeah. Their strategy is clear to halt climate change by working within the system and lobbying politicians into pushing through legislative and economic reform. I've come to Boston to find out how the Sunrise Movement has become a force to be reckoned with in U.S. politics. Leading the charge is 26-year-old Varshni Prakash. While studying at Massachusetts, she joined the university's fossil fuel divestment campaign before co-founding Sunrise in 2015. So you've been with the Sunrise Movement from the very beginning. What made you start it? A number of us young people, uh, all under the age of 30, were seeing that the hurricanes were getting bigger, the fire seasons were getting longer, the floods were getting bigger, but there wasn't a movement big enough for young people to ensure that we had a habitable planet for our future generations. Can you talk more about why you feel you need to act right now? So scientists are telling us right now that we have just 12 years to make unprecedented changes, to transform every part of our economy and our society, to decarbonize, to get off fossil fuels, to invest in renewables, and to protect life and, and human civilization on this planet as we know it. And yet our politicians have not done what's necessary. They have not built and garnered the political will that we need, and people are dying as a result. At the heart of the Sunrise strategy is the Green New Deal, a radical environmental change policy, the idea for which was conceived in the US in the 1960s. The deal's goal is to completely transform the US economy by ending its dependency on fossil fuels, investing instead in renewable energy and creating jobs in the process. The Green New Deal is a massive economic mobilization at a scale that we have not seen in this country since World War II. That is an effort to stop climate change and create millions of good jobs. I'm curious to find out whether real political change is possible with people power alone, particularly by those so young. I've come to the Sunrise Boston Hub. There are 204 hubs like this spread across the nation. Here, every month, 60 Sunrise members gather to share experiences and get behind the cause. Welcome to our April 2nd Hub Meeting. All right, let's everybody get up and we're gonna get into it. There is a crack in everything. Hubs give people of all backgrounds an opportunity to come together and voice their concerns. Every single person who decided to come to this meeting today is a part of this movement, is a part of this greater moment in history. These are young people who need to be heard. It's 
great to have people to talk to. If we're a team, we, we have to keep fighting. Yeah. Yeah. And they want to take positive steps to fix the world we live in. Can I get a show of hands of the folks who actually went through the climate strike? Yeah! Woo! The hub splits into breakout groups where they plan their next actions. What do we think will actually make high schoolers enlist? We just post like a, a green background with the words like Green New Deal and put a link in our bio or something. I don't interrupt, so feel free to ignore me. Do your friends in high school care about climate change? A lot of people I know know that climate change is an issue. They're, that's not the debate. The debate is how willing they are to get involved. I think a lot of young people don't feel like they have the power at all to make any change. If we actually come together, we totally can change so many things. I thought I was coming into a meeting, and it's really a lot more than that. There's energy. They're engaged. You feel the sense of urgency. It's not a distant, vague reality for them. This is their future, and you can feel that here. But for all their passion, how effective has Sunrise actually been? Varshni has invited me to her home to show the impact Sunrise has had in the top tiers of power. So this was from our first action at Nancy Pelosi's office mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. And as you can see, there's literally hundreds of young people lining up the halls, and they're carrying signs that say, what is your plan? Mm. Our ultimate goal was to share our vision of what the Green New Deal is all about. Looking at this, there seems to be a sort of plan of action, right? There's a, there's a style that Sunrise is using to achieve your goals. We're really trying to embody the fact that we are young people fighting for our future. And we want it to be joyous. And we want it to be raucous. And we want it to be serious. And we want it to be determined and resolved. Sunari say that older generations' chronic inactivity on environmental issues is inexcusable. The United States will cease all implementation of the non-binding Paris Accord. The current Republic government refuses to even acknowledge there is a problem. So Sunrise believe they must act to make change happen. It is life or death for Kentucky right now. And they are being heard. The green generation has risen up. A growing number of Democrat senators now support the Green New Deal. And Sunrise have found influential political allies in socially conscious representatives like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. This is right before Representative Ocasio-Cortez unprecedentedly joined us on her first day of orientation as a new congresswoman to say that we have Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic Party's back in pushing for the most progressive and ambitious energy agenda this country has ever seen. This is about unity, this is about solidarity, and this is about the fact that we are going to make a better future for our kids, and we know that she's gonna be there with us. That's what this is about. <laughs> But firm opposition to the Green New Deal remains. On the 26th of March, 2019, a draft of the deal was unanimously rejected by the Republican-controlled Senate. How did you feel when the resolution got voted down in the Senate? The goal of the resolution is for it to be a statement of values, um, to chart a blueprint, to lay out the projects of what would be included within the Green New Deal. We need an attitude shift. We need to put into gear and into momentum these big ideas so that we can write the policy over the next year and get these things to pass. Sunrise aimed to create momentum for their cause by directly lobbying political leaders. How are you doing? How are you doing? Sean and okay. his team plan to doorstep Andrea Campbell, the president of Boston City Council. Got it. So the goal today is to get her to sign the No Fossil Fuel Money Pledge. Got it. Uh, later down the road, we're working with her and uh, several other councillors uh, to craft a resolution for a Green New Deal that's going to pass the city council. Shall we? Yeah, absolutely. Let's go. The first step for the group is to encourage politicians to sign a pledge promising that they will refuse money from fossil fuel companies who want them to act in their interests. Yes, sir. Over 1,400 politicians have signed so far. As we approach the council president's office, I'm struck by this group's confidence. They walk straight in. 
Jill. Nice to meet you. How are you doing? I'm Sean Onagy. Nice to meet you. We're pumped. We're here to ask you if you could sign the No Fossil Fuel Money Pledge. Absolutely. I mean, I will say before I even, you know, sign this, um, thank you for your advocacy in your, <laughs> your work. This stuff doesn't happen by accident if people aren't showing up. So happy to participate, happy to do this. I just wanted to say thank you. So it's not just a movement where they're confronting a lot of hostility. They're actually getting support and encouragement and warmth, really, from politicians. I think we lead by example. Um, I know I do. And so by saying, let's do this, signing on and committing, we hope that others will follow our lead. It's impressive to see these young people having genuine success in the halls of power. Having meetings like this is really refreshing because it shows that we do have allies out there and that we can be working within the system to, to promote change that we want to see in the world. Good job, team. Yes. <laughs> the Sunrise Movement is clearly influential and it's getting results where it matters most. Their ultimate goal is to convince the majority of congressmen and women to sponsor the Green New Deal. So when the next government is elected in 2020, the bill has the weight of support to make it policy. The Sunrise Movement is asking for a lot and they're asking for it quickly. Critics say they're too idealistic, but for a problem as massive as climate change, we do need ambitious, radical solutions now. Today's environmentalists cite uprisings of the past as proof that incredible social change really is possible. In 1903 in Britain, the suffragettes campaigned for women to have the right to vote. With a rallying cry of deeds not words, they often resorted to extreme acts. At Epsom Racecourse, Emily Davidson even gave her life for the cause. These tactics worked. In 1928, women won equal voting rights in Britain. 35 years later in America, the civil rights movement sought to end racial segregation. Martin Luther King led the peaceful protests. Nonviolence is the most potent weapon available to the Negro in his struggle for freedom and human dignity. By 1968, after a decade of campaigning, African Americans had secured legal rights to equal employment, voting, and housing. By analyzing past civil resistance movements, political scientist Erica Chenoweth identified a threshold for success. If 3.5% of the population mobilize against the establishment, social change will happen. Whilst many of us know that we have to change the way we treat our planet, there is one group which is taking things to the next level. In October 2018, a group of activists, angered by political inaction on climate change, declared themselves to be an open defiance of the UK government. They called themselves Extinction Rebellion, or XR for short. Are you doing the right thing by arresting anything at the moment you've been placed to date? They work outside the system, engaging in bold, non-violent acts of civil disobedience. Their strategy is to create headline-grabbing protests designed to maximise public exposure. They believe this will gain them a mass following and force real change. In just six months, they have already expanded into 15 countries spread across four continents. I'm at their London headquarters on the day of one of their most extreme actions yet. In a protest they are calling Blood of Our Children, XR plan to spill 500 litres of fake blood on Downing Street, the office and residence of the British Prime Minister. Hi Claire. Hello. I'm Megan. Hi. It's really nice to meet you. One of XR's co-founders is Claire Farrell. Where did the idea of the blood of our children come from? We're already suffering a, a genocide because of the impacts of pollution. So. We're trying with this action to get people to understand that, it's, that it kills people and that it kills people now. It's already killing people. It's not like something ahead in the future. As we make our way to Downing Street, I want to know why they're compelled to confront the political establishment in such a drastic way. 
we think it's important that our actions are directed at government because there's only, I think, a, a state-led effort internationally that's going to make a meaningful change to the situation that we're in. So we're trying to represent the kind of visceral reality of death and suffering which climate change has already started to cause around the world and which it will cause in the future. The procession is designed to feel like a funeral march. It comes to a stop and the crowd falls silent. This is the blood of my children, of your children and of the young people here today. XR are making a profound statement, just a stone's throw from the Prime Minister's office. We need to take action. We don't have much time left. Please don't let this be the reality. I'm struck by the raw emotion on display. But what is the political change that Extinction Rebellion want to see? What do you want to achieve by all of this? We do have three main demands. The first one is for the government to tell the truth, to help to communicate the crisis to the public. The second demand is to reduce carbon emissions to net zero by 2025. And then the third demand, which I think is the main prize, is to um, achieve structural political change in the form of a citizens' assembly. Ordinary people who are educated on the facts and then come together to talk about what might be the best route forward. Do you think it's achievable? Um, I think it's necessary. XR want to become impossible to ignore, so its members are planning the biggest protest yet. They hope to bring London to a standstill with a two-week human blockade of the city's streets. At XR's HQ, I'm meeting one of the chief coordinators of the shutdown, Larch Maxi. What we're doing for with the rebellion is having a go at causing the level of disruption that could bring about you know, the government to meet our demands. Do you think that you're at risk of almost alienating yourself by crossing over into that illegal category? Look, there's a climate crisis, there's an ecological crisis. We're here to stop this existential threat that we face. We're non-violent, we're maintaining respect, we're putting ourselves on the lines, we're risking our own liberty. The plan is to block the streets of the UK's capital with walls of people. They'll chain, lock and even glue themselves to structures and to one another. These actions are deliberately planned to create maximum disruption and cause arrests. Jess Lichtenstein trains members on how to deal with the police in a non-violent way. Can we have a activist who is willing to be arrested and carried off to a police van in the middle? Can. You're willing to get arrested, but you're not going to make it easy for them. So members are trained to go limp as soon as they are touched. All right, well, it's pretty clear. We're going we're to arrest you now. <laughs> so it would take as many as five police officers to remove a single activist. By maximising the number of arrests, XR believe they can create publicity and a groundswell of support. For Extinction Rebellion, this is the only way forward, this is the only way they believe that things are going to improve, is through civil disobedience and these kinds of actions. Fifteenth of April 2019, and it's the morning of the London shutdown. The organisers are expecting thousands of protesters. They plan to block London's main streets and bridges for two weeks, bringing the city to a grinding halt. I'm meeting Claire as she prepares for what could be the biggest demonstration in XR's history. You can come in. Thank you. Are you feeling hopeful? I'm feeling hopeful that we're going to have more impact than we ever have and more people are going to understand the message and the, and the seriousness of it. The reason why we have to do this is because it is this bad. We do feel this afraid of our future. We don't know what else to do. Let's go. Extinction Rebellion's target is the government, but the people who will be hit hardest today are the everyday commuters as they try to get to work. There's potential then that all of this could be disrupted and people might not be able to get to where they're going because of the actions that are taking place. And how is that justified? 
we're really sorry, we don't really want to do this, but we also don't want to pass on an unlivable planet to the next generation. We arrive at Oxford Circus at 8.30 a.m. and only a handful of activists are here. Uh. We quickly get a taste of where public favour might lie. I'm not quite sure how the group will succeed in blocking the very heart of London. What's the plan here? Because at the moment, the road isn't occupied. There's nothing on it, so what's going to happen? Groups of people are going to close roads, and then something should be arriving. That way for me, Out of the blue, reinforcements arrive. <laughs> With something I didn't expect. This is a proper boat. You've literally brought a proper boat into the, the middle of Oxford. <laughs> Hundreds of activists crowd around the boat and the London shutdown has begun. In a matter of hours, 10,000 supporters descend upon five sites across the capital. Oxford Circus, Parliament Square, Marble Arch, Piccadilly Circus and Waterloo Bridge manned by Larch and his team. They have blocked the entire stretch of road with trees, a music stage, camps and a human wall at both ends. I've managed to find Larch, who has started to notice police activity. So I'm, yeah, I'm just watching them go by, yeah. What's been happening? Oh, we're just kind of monitoring the police. Uh, there's numbers have increased slightly. Mm. At some point, they're going to be under pressure to clear the bridge. I mean, what we've got to try and do is get numbers to build. The question is, how much disruption will the government force us to create until they do the right thing and meet the demands and start to try and keep us safe? And you're willing to lose your liberty for it and get arrested? If people are willing to sacrifice their liberty, it sends a message to the public, to the media and to the, gov the politicians that this is a serious issue. Elsewhere, demonstrations are escalating as protesters target the largest oil and gas company in Europe, Shell. I've just ran down to a site where some rebels have super glued themselves and locked themselves up outside Shell HQ. Well, we're here today to take action and defend life. I meet Lyndon Edwardson, one of the lead demonstrators here. Tell me a little bit about why you're here. Shell have known about the problem of climate change for over 30 years and they are one of the biggest emitters of carbon in the world. These acts of criminal damage are the catalyst for the police to make their first arrests. need to hold Shell accountable for the atrocities to humankind and to our natural world. We've just seen two Extinction Rebellion rebels being taken away by police. And ultimately, Extinction Rebellion are getting exactly what they're after. Eight hours after the shutdown began, police take action, citing Section 14 of the Public Order Act, which forbids obstruction of the highway. More than 1,000 arrests and 30,000 new recruits later, and with growing support across 33 countries, the UK government finally agrees to meet XR. On the 1st of May 2019, the House of Commons makes history, becoming the first national parliament in the world to declare a climate and ecological emergency. Climate change activism stretches back 50 years. April the 22nd, 1970, saw the launch of Earth Day. 20 million Americans took to the streets and the modern environmental movement was born. In the 80s, Greenpeace took matters into their own hands, heading to the seas to battle the commercial dumping of toxic waste, nuclear testing and whale hunting. Today, the movement has a new figurehead in teenager Greta Thunberg. The older generations have failed tackling the biggest crisis humanity has ever faced. By going on school strike, she inspired 1.4 million students in 112 countries to join her in a global walkout. The message has been clear for 50 years, but today the voices are louder and more insistent than ever. Their cry, change must happen now.